OK. Thanks for that. Um, I'm having trouble for whatever reason now opening the PDF that you sent me. Um, but, uh, yeah, so so welcome, everybody. We have apologies, obviously, from Councillor Hannah, Roger Ridley, David Heron, and Andrew Murray. Is that right? Have we That's right. We also, we also have additional apologies from Victoria McCree. OK, thanks for that. Um, have we got any declarations of interest, either on... In general, or in any item that's uh, been mentioned today? No? Okay. Excuse me while I try. My PDF was opening earlier and it's now no longer opening, so apologies for that. Uh, mm -hmm. Just give me a couple of seconds. Let's see. Ya. Well, I try and do that, um, but I think uh, before we just start the main part of the meeting, we would be remiss of me not to mention this is uh, Patricia's last clinical uh, governance meeting. I know we'll get to see it, most of us will get to see you next week, Patricia, at um, at the main IJB, but uh, some won't. So I think uh, firstly to thank you for all your efforts. Uh, not just in this committee, but the wider uh, what you've done for 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 the health board, for for uh, for the council, and, and through the IJB. I, I was just kind of looking at a little bit about your background. You're I, absolutely, and some things come up where you know where she mentions what she's done before, and I think, how did you fit all that in? And she's been an absolute polymath, like they say, of uh, of nursing, of local authority. I mean, she starts. She's been with us. I've got some notes here, Patricia. I did prepare for this. Um, but she's obviously been with us for, for eight years uh, with as well, Chief Officer and Social Care Partnership. But when you look at her background, started as a nurse uh, and then moving into roles as a specialist lecturer at Glasgow Caledonian University, my old university. I don't think I came across you there, Patricia. Um, and a uh, number of national roles, Sports Scotland, Scottish Consumer Council, Health Education Board for Scotland, and as well, of course, her role in local government. Um, we don't often say this, uh, you know, nobody's irreplaceable, but you will be a very difficult act to follow. So, behalf of me, behalf of this committee, uh, thank you very much for all your efforts, and uh, we'll certainly we'll see you next week where we can all give you a proper goodbye uh, in person because I think we're coming through to to focus on next week, but just mark our, uh, our thanks for all your efforts. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, clinical care governance has been one of the areas where we've put a lot of effort into developing this process with support from colleagues in the health board and um, Sarah as chief social work officer. So um, I think it's in a good place, but more to do. Um, but really delighted to leave it in the condition that it's in with all the involvement of colleagues so of course our stakeholders Margot's with us in the room today and our partnership has been strengthened by the input of our stakeholders and the voices of those people who use our services to help us um, improve so it's been a it's been a great journey and really appreciate leaving behind some really good colleagues so thank you no, you have done that. You've, you've helped us, to, uh, you, as you're right. There's, there's always a journey. We'll, we'll, ne we'll, we'll never get to the complete end, but I think it's always a work in progress. But you've left it in very good shape, so thanks for that. Um, so uh, presenting today, we've got, we've got uh, looking oversight will be Suzanne. Suzanne's also got the inspections report. Trauma champions will be Julie. Julia. Uh, duty of candor will be Sarah. Uh, complaints and feedback, Gordon and, and Ailey. Uh, our usual uh, infection report will be Jonathan, and then, and then publications by Suzanne. I am having trouble opening my PDF, so I think the next part on the agenda is section five, which is uh, oversight. Is that correct, Suzanne? Mm -hmm. We have the minutes first, Stephen, and then the oh, action. Sorry, thanks for that. Yeah, can we, the minutes of the last meeting, are we happy they are a, a true record? Um, if anyone wants to go through them, as I say, I don't have them up on my screen, unfortunately. Uh, if there's any amendments or, or anything uh, we need to change in that, you can let us know. If not, are we happy to approve those minutes? Yeah. Great. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. So we're now moving to the main body of the meeting. So, Suzanne, sorry, 
Sorry, Stephen, it's the actual hug. Sorry, do you want me to go through the actual hug on your behalf? I know they closed this down and try and open the PDF, but I would appreciate if you went through the actual log. Thank yeah. you very much. Okay, thanks. Um, so the action logs on page 13 of your papers, and you will see that the two actions in relation to adverse deaths, there's an update on suicide and drug-related death prevention on this agenda. The complaints and feedback performance report, again, there's information on the organisation of learning from complaints on the agenda today. And there is one closed action around the, the math standards, but the other two actions should be closed if a satisfactory discussion at today's meeting. Thank you. Thanks for that, I'm back in the room. We're good to go. I've got my papers up now. OK, thanks very much. So it is definitely now Section 5 overview local oversight arrangements. Thank you, Chair, um, and welcome, colleagues. Um, the report provides a summary overview of the local oversight and assurance arrangements that are in place and those that are relevant to the Health and Social Care Partnership. It's intended to provide assurance to the committee members of these arrangements. So at Section 4 of the report, an update is provided on the Falkirk Public Protection Chief Officers Group's most recent meeting on the 13th of December uh, 2023, and the meeting considered several items, including the agreement of an improvement plan, which was created following the completion of the Child Protection Learning Review, um, a report on Falkirk's Child Protection Committee on the increase in child protection registrations, and that covered several scrutiny and improvement areas being undertaken relating to registration. An update paper on the Falkirk Suicide Prevention Subgroup was also noted um, and the group are developing a protocol for identifying and responding to clusters or locations of particular concern. And the development of that protocol will be based on national guidance and supported by Public Health Scotland colleagues. At Section 5 of the report, we've provided an overview on NHS Fourth Valley Clinical Governance Committee um, meeting, which was held on the 16th of January this year. Table 1 details the report, um, updates and presentations and discussion, and those give assurance of safe, effective, person-centred care. The agenda for the Clinical Governance Working Group meeting on the 8th of February uh, this year was also set out at Table 2 of the report and details the reports and updates that were considered at the meeting. The Health and Social Care Partnership and NHS Board Wally colleagues continue to work with care homes and care home staff to support and assure infection prevention and control measures to support outbreak management and to ensure that fundamental care needs of residents are being met. The Care Home Assurance section of the report provides an update on the work since the last update to committee. In response to the request at a previous committee meeting, information on the number of placements as well as reviews completed and remaining is included in the table. And just to note that the number of completed reviews completed by the chart team from October last year to January this year was 94. And the total number of placements funded by Falkirk Council, both in and out of our area, um, as of January this year, is 884 placements. And the total number of um, adults allocated um, to the chart is 700, so that's about 79% of placements they received. Um, and the remainder of those reviews are undertaken by locality and specialist teams. At um, Falkirk um, Adult Protection Committee is set out at Section 7 of the report, and this includes an update on stepped guidance for general practitioners and adult social work service and other non-medical staff, which has been produced and launched. That was developed by um, our lead GP, David Heron, and our adult support protection lead officer, Gerard Ritchie. It's expected that this year tool will further strengthen our collaboration in ensuring that adults who require an assessment of their ability to make specific decisions will receive it at the right time. The Alcohol and Drug Partnership is included in Section 8, and the IJB will receive a more detailed report at its meeting next week, but we've included an update um, to committee in this report around the newly formed ADP executive, uh, the terms of reference, and the new chair and vice chair arrangements. And plans are also underway to develop subgroups and thematic alliances, which will begin to take place and have started already. Discussions are ongoing with the Scottish Recovery Consortium and other ADPs and local partners to develop a lived experience panel for Falkirk, and it's intended that the panel chair would sit on the ADP executive. 
Um, we're also doing work um, to refresh the ADP delivery plan, and that will be informed by full needs assessment and gap analysis. Um, we'll need additional capacity to ident has been identified to adequately implement the work of the ADP, and a new role has been developed and funding agreed, and we're in the process of starting recruitment to those posts. Uh, Falkirk Suicide and Drug-Related Death Prevention Update is included at Section 9 of the report. Uh, Falkirk ADB has agreed to fund a post to support drug-related deaths reviews and there are active discussions ongoing. Um, the Suicide Prevention Subgroup, um, which reports into the Falkirk Mental Health and Wellbeing Planning Group, continues to meet on a six-week basis. It's a multi-agency group and we're looking at sort of preventative work and a fourth valley prevention plan is being developed. Falkirk um, Clinical and Care Governance Management Group met on the 5th of um, January this year and the meeting agenda is included um, with flash reports considered uh, about the meeting. And finally, at, at section 11 of the report, we've included an update on the considerations of the Health and Social Safety Management Group meeting on the 30th of January this year. So in conclusion, the report provides a summary of the relevant oversight arrangements and meetings for the Clinical mm -hmm. Governance Committee. The committee is asked to consider and comment on the contents of the report as set out in the recommendation at 2.1. Um, and finally, just to say, I'm joined by colleagues today um, who attend many of these meetings and can answer any specific questions you may have. Thank you. Thanks, Suzanne. Uh, lots going on as usual. Um, Yes, we've got colleagues in the room uh, uh, through in Falkirk who attend a lot of these meetings, so the opportunity is there to ask them any questions, seek any clarification, any observations on that report. I'm not seeing any hands go up, so, so I'll ask a question. You might not have the answer to it. Obviously, Police Scotland released their I know the, the official suicide figures just last week showing, I think, was it a 10% increase? Uh, and I, I don't know if there's any early indications of what we're seeing within Falkirk. It's good to see that we're going to fund a post in that space, but uh, have we any any indication if, the, if there's been an increase? Does anybody know? Thank you, John. Thanks, Stacey. Uh -huh. Stacey, I wonder if you would be able to pick up that question. Yeah, morning everyone. Um, so I'm Stacey McIntosh, I'm the Strategic Prevention Coordinator for Suicide and Substance Use Deaths in Forth Valley and I work with uh, Public Health. Um, so the police uh, data and the uh, our data sometimes differs a little bit um, and that's because we base our data on the uh, National Records of Scotland figures. So though the 2023 figures unfortunately won't be published until later in the year, so they normally come out around about August time. Um, so it will be sort of August before we're able to sort of really confirm that, to be honest. Um, but there is, as, as Suzanne mentioned, there's lots of, of preventative work um, ongoing at the moment. So, No, I, I, I appreciate that. And I kind of wonder why the police put theirs out before. But uh, because it, it kind of, it, it just caught the headlines last week, which I was a bit uncomfortable with. But uh, thanks for that. We'll, we'll see what the, 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 the national stats bring later on in the year. But it's good to see, you know, the good work going on in that particular area. Any other questions? On or comments on that report? Michael, it's really just a, a comment inspired by uh, First Minister's questions yesterday. And I really feel that um, we're doing an above average job in, in trying to sort of cut um, numbers, etc. And I'm interested in the, the, the sort of um, participation together with uh, Sterling and Clarks. Is there any more information on that? Is that excuse me, in relation to the drug? Yes. So, yeah, we, we have joined the commission and consulted Clarks and Sterling, and we're looking at, I guess, the, the wider commission of services across the whole of Hope Valley. So that work continues, but as the report indicates, there are significant challenges around yes. capacity in Falkirk and a number of the agencies that we work with are really struggling to recruit to posts. And which really is 
why we ask for that strategic assessment around what is it usually we need, particularly in fall or on the wider or valley footprint, and how can we adjust our services to meet that demand. So that works ongoing and we'll get much more detailed updates for this group and future IGID meetings. Um, there is a report going to the IGID uh, next week, um, which touches a bit on some of the work of the ADP, but not the exact detail of that work. But we'd be happy to bring something at future date. Thank you. Thank you, Okay, thanks for that, Martin. Any other comments on that paper? Okay, I'm happy to move on to section six, which is the inspections reports. Again, uh, Suzanne, and again, we're just been asked to consider and comment on the content of this report. So over to you again, Suzanne. Yeah, thank you again, Chair. Um, this report provides an overview of recently published inspection reports of registered health and social care partnership services uh, since the last initiation report. Uh, there's been one care inspectorate inspection report and one mental welfare commission uh, for Scotland visit report published, um, and these are presented in the report to committee. Um, action plans from these reports are monitored by relevant management groups, and the table provides links to those full published reports. In relation to Woodlands Resource Centre, it had an announced, sorry, can't get my tongue, announced Mental Welfare Commission visit on October last year. Um, and this is to the Adult Integrated Community Mental Health Team, which is located in Woodlands Centre at the Community Hospital. It comprises of two teams, both for the Eastern West, and they provide mental health assessment and care and treatment for adults with mental illness living in the community. As a result of the inspection, three recommendations were identified and a response has since been submitted to the Mental Welfare Commission. And an update on the three recommendations that arose from that report is noted in the body of the report. Um, Grahamston House Care Home had an unannounced care inspectorate visit on the 11th of January this year, and that was to follow up on one requirement in two areas for improvement made since the previous inspection. Grahamston House uh, provides care and support for up to 36 older people living with dementia, and four of the places can be offered uh, to people for a short break service. The inspection process considered one quality indicator, how well do we support people's wellbeing, and that was created as food, which is a four on a six-point scale where six is excellent. The board noted that the improvements had been made to how people were supported with their nutritional needs and how they were supported to spend their day, and improvements had been made to staffing levels and management oversight and quality assurance. So in conclusion, the report provides a summary of the relevant inspection reports which have been published. As I've noted earlier, improvement actions plans are monitored by lead service managers and by the senior management team in the clinical and care governance management group. And committee members can highlight if they think or want more detailed consideration of any of these inspection reports. So the committee, as noted, each year is asked to consider and comment on the recommendations sorry, on the contents of the report set and the recommendation of 2.1. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thanks, Rosanna. Any, any questions, comments, observations on those that report and those particular two inspections? No? Okay, I think, you know, it, listen, we don't, I think we always welcome these inspections. They kind of keep us on our toes. And it's good to get the feedback and, and, and see if there's improvements there. So uh, thanks for that. So if we move on to uh, section seven, which is the trauma champions. And uh, Julia is going to uh, provide an update on this. And again, this is for consideration and comments. Julia. Thanks very much, Chair. Uh, good morning, folks. Nice to see you all. I'm Julia Ferrari, Service Manager for the Community Mental Health Services in Falkirk and also one of the trauma, champ trauma champions. Uh, which is, um, uh, I'm grateful for a little bit of time on the agenda this morning. Um, it's quite a long report, this, and, I, and I'm going to try to be fairly brief around about it. Um, colleagues might remember that um, I came to the committee back in August 22 um, and walked through a lot of the background and context as we started this 
a uh, trauma champion kind of kind of journey. So uh, with that in mind, there's lots of this information that's still in this report, just so that colleagues have that background and where this came from and where the inception of the trauma champions came about. Um, essentially, the just just very briefly though, essentially the 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 aim of the um, trauma champions and the trauma informed practice um, kind of movement is to. Um, is for us to have a, a trauma-informed and responsive nation and workforce. That's the aim from the from the Scottish government, and very much signed up to from COSLA and other and other partners. Um, within the report, we've got um, some details around about some of the um, work that's happened so far. Um, and, I, and I want to sort of just draw a bit of attention to we um, probably since the last time I, I was here, we have employed a trauma champion, trauma policy officer. Um, and um, we've had a uh, funding from the from the government fifty thousand pounds over over the two year period, which we've used for um, that development post. And um, she has done um, outstanding work actually um, in the time that she's been in post. And I guess for for us um, as trauma champions, there's there's myself, there's the service manager in justice services, and um, the service manager within the social work training and workforce development area. Our, our interest is is building a sustainable service so that whatever we put in place and whatever our trauma trauma policy officer has kind of really a lot of groundswell around about this work that we are able to sustain that and we actually continue that model uh, forthwith with setting a culture and with our new staff that come on board and our, our turnover of staff. Um, just kind of moving to the to the part where she's she's sort of demonstrated the kind of updated work, which is sort of 4.15 and, and forthwith. Um, there's been a, a huge amount of work that's um, done in terms of um, developing the um, the training. So if if I can sort of mention a little bit about the uh, informed level training. Um, so there was work undertaken with the customer and uh, business support. Uh, the trauma-informed practice level training was developed and delivered across the support assistance and section leads across adult and children's services. Um, and, and I think really importantly, anecdotally, following this, the staff felt, you know, reported that they were feeling more capable of supporting people who have experienced trauma within the context of their role. And kind of crucially, uh, described a, a quite an important shift in perspective when thinking about the presenting behaviours that they that they may have faced, um, and and I think that's that in essence is what we want to grab with this work, um, the trauma lens tool, which which the the graphics there up in three point six, that that in itself is I've, we've left that in this report because. That is the tangible tool that really helps us to sort of work with some of the the key bits of this um, and supports leads of of team steering group, the Force Valley steering group, to be feeding in well, the Falkirk right. elements feeding in. But you know we we can't cut off all of the I suppose what we can get from a Force Valley approach and all of the leverage that we get from a Force Valley approach but this steering group's been agreed to be a, a Falkirk level and could obviously be council and health and social care partnership so more of that to come um, but there is a commitment to doing it um, but the decision was made to allow for a workshop to take place with a much larger leadership group across mm -hmm. Falkirk Council and the health and social care partnership to then make sure that we've got um, motivated leaders who will support the implementation group stroke board. So hopefully that gives you, um, Julia, a bit of confidence and, and committee a bit of confidence that we are keeping a really close eye on how we maintain the momentum and support the work that's been done by our trauma champions and the Fourth Valley Steering Group. But my thanks to you, Julia, and to others. Thanks, thanks Julia. Really appreciate that, Sarah. That's really that's really good feedback. Um, uh, but and I and I and I do think that 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 is definitely part of what the part of the challenge around, around about the steering group is that we're all slightly sitting in different places and different directions and and there's a there's a sort of similar post to the trauma policy officer that we have here in Claxton and Stirling but they're they're slightly di slightly different posts at slightly different stages and I, and I think it's again it's as with many things striking that balance uh, between let's make sure we've got an equitable over fourth valley type approach to this but also let's make sure what we're doing in Falkirk is right and that feels like it's sustainable and, and we're working across our, our leadership and that and building capacity across our system. So it's, I think I think that's exactly the right and we've discussed that as trauma champions um, as well and, and we agree that that would be that would be really helpful but as a, as a feed in almost but once we've worked out those details I, I think it would be I think that's really good. 
No, th th thanks for that as, uh, update as well, Sarah, because one of my questions was how do we, you know, how do we start to really mainstream a lot of this work and and, uh, and, and you gave us a, a, an indication of what's happening, but um, yeah, I think we need to be looking at this fourth valley ride as well. Um, excellent. Any other comments, questions, observations in that report? Stephen, if I could come in. Yeah, Just... so we've got Patricia and then we've got Linda. Just add my comments and commend the work that has been done by Julia and the other trauma champions. I think it's a really good example of how when we work in an integrated way, we can achieve so much. Um, but again, we need to do it deep as well as wide. So good that there are these continued developments um, within the council, but also Pan Force Valley. So really good piece of work, but, but more to do so that we do embed it and we keep topping it up as new staff come in so that it does become part of our organisational DNA. Thanks. No, that's a good point. It almost, these things, they almost have to be part of your induction, don't you, when you bring you bring new staff on? Yeah, so, and that's always, because if the danger is it gets watered down once you have that first raft of people through. So you've got to keep that momentum up, absolutely. Linda? No, it was just really to, to reiterate everything everybody said, Stephen. I think it's an amazing piece of work. You can just feel Julia's enthusiasm when she's talking it through. But I think the the positive thing from what uh, Sarah and Patricia have said is that sometimes there's always a worry that it's, it's person dependent, but it sounds as if that whole process round about it is is in place to make it sustainable. So just great work. And uh, I think I'm... I think it's a great report. Thanks for that. Thanks, Linda. No, great stuff. Thanks, Julia. Any other comments? We're happy to move on to the next section. Thanks, Chair. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Julia. So we we'll move on to section eight, which is uh, duty of candor. And this is Sarah. It's got this. Thank you, Chair. And again, consider and comment on the report, Sarah. Yeah. Thank you. Local authority chief social work officers must publish a duty of candour report annually and we need to notify the care inspectorate that we have done that. So in Falkirk, um, I published the report within my chief social work officer annual report. This has already been approved by Falkirk Council um, at the meeting that took place in December 2023. So it's already been submitted to the Chief Social Work Advisor at Scottish Government. And that, again, is just part of, of, of my statutory responsibilities. The, just to let you all know that the uh, Chief Social Work Officer Annual Report will be presented to the IGB on, in March, on the 22nd of March. So the relevant extract from my Chief Social Work Officer Report that contains the uh, Clinical Key Governance Annual Report is attached to Appendix 1 for your information. So just by way of a bit of a background, all health and social care services in Scotland have a duty of candour. That came into effect in 2018. It's a legal re requirement and it means that when unintended or unexpected events happen that result in death or harm, as defined in the legislation, that the people that are affected understand what's happened and that they receive an apology. And organisations have to be able to demonstrate learning and how we improve for the future. So the activation outcomes for duty of candour are provided in section three of the cover report, and that section also includes care provider and organisational responsibilities. Appendix one reports that there have been no incidences of duty of candour for the reporting year. For assurance, though, committee um, is asked to note the importance that we place on ensuring that staff understand their responsibilities regarding duty of candour. This is required in order for us to have confidence that incidences can be identified and the procedure followed. Staff complete e-module training at the point of induction. Seven minute briefings are used in team meetings as refresher opportunities. Uh, our learning review process and guidance um, for a complaints procedures reference organisational duty of candour. A reporting template has been created and we use that to ensure consistency of reporting across all of our services. So the annual report uh, appendix one captures our commitment to transparent practice and acknowledges the need to support staff with distressing incidents. 
Clinical Key Governance um, are asked to consider and comment on this report and Chair, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Um, any questions, comments, observations on that annual report? No. OK, well, thanks for that, Sarah. That's a, that was an easy one for you. OK, uh, so move on to section nine, which is complaints and feedback, which is Gordon and Ailey. Uh, thank you, Chair. It's Gordon McKenzie. I'll go, I'll go first. Um, just uh, to summarise, really, that's in, in the report, um, tables, uh, one and two at four point three you give a breakdown of the uh the number of complaints and uh, how those were the notable thing there is the 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 number of complaints responded to within time scale is improving um but the overall number of complaints is is going down and we'll look into that further for the next uh for the next report because we're we're coming back down to sort of pandemic level complaints where we saw uh, reduction, um, 95 compl uh, complaints in the last year uh, was the sort of pre-pandemic level. So we'll we'll have a bit of a look into that a bit further before the next uh, the next report and see if we can uh, identify any any reason for that for that change or whether it's just a a statistical variation. Um, moving down the uh, the through the report at. Uh, 4.5 we've got the outcome of the complaints and you can see over the last uh, year a couple of years we've increased the number of upheld and partially upheld uh, complaints has increased that's partly because we've taken a view that we want to learn from those from complaints rather than take a very narrow you know does it fulfill the criteria of uh, being upheld or not and, and uh, where there's there's doubt look and see can we you know what can we learn from this so I'm, I'm relatively comfortable with the the, the figures uh, moving in the direction that they are I think it I think we'll be more responsive in the way that we're we're looking at complaints um 4.7 uh, table 3 gives a breakdown of the complaints within the social work adult services area by uh, the, the major areas of activity. Uh, again, we'll look to improve this when we've got some time to get staff on to, to show um, the sort of volumes of activity and give you some context there. But the, the MEX team, Mobile Emergency Care Service, has about three and a half thousand uh, service users. Uh, the next largest area would be home care, um, uh, seven or eight hundred, and community care, who are obviously being supported every day. And the community care teams in, across all three of them will have, uh, you know, a couple of hundred uh, clients at any one time, um, though perhaps not the same uh, intensity of involvement uh, across across all of them. So it's not surprising to see that the the larger number of complaints come come in those areas. But we'll give a bit more detail on on that as I say in in, in further uh, future reports and finally just uh, I think it was raised last time but learning complaints at 4.10 got some information that's it's as kind of general uh, level information because obviously we don't want to go into the individual complaints and identify potentially identify complainants but um, you can see at uh, the first bullet point there um, one of the issues that's come across quite quite clearly uh, in the MEC service has been about you know response times and and what people's expectations should be and so a bit of work going on there just now to improve that so that we're sharing with uh, the service users and their representatives what they can expect from the service to try and uh, establish uh, expect you know, make make sure that our expectations are aligned to uh, what, what we can actually deliver um and and uh, as i say also there there's there's you know it's an ongoing issue but people's expectations about what the service can offer and and we need to be clear about what our eligibility criteria is and, and support staff in the very difficult circumstances that they face uh, with individual service users the individual service users themselves are obviously 
facing uh, a great deal of difficulty and trying to navigate our way through that can be challenging at times. So those are the three main areas that um, I think that we have highlighted that we will continue to look to to develop our service and get better at. Happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thanks, Gordon. Any questions for Gordon? No. OK, Gordon, you go off lately as well. So we'll move on to Ailey. If you thank go off you. as lately, Ailey. I know, fingers crossed. Um, thank you very much, Sharon. Thank you, Gordon. From the health side of the business, the complaints performance is sort of lifted around 0.4 in the um, report as well. In terms of the quarterly performance reported, um, it was 70%. Year-to-date performance is currently sitting at 47.8%. Um, so that the current reporting quarter um, was actually a really significant uplift in where we'd been for the rest of the year. And we've kind of continued to see that trend spanning into January and February so far. So it is all steps in the right direction. Um, the average time to respond within the last quarter was 67 days, and that is something that we will look to start to build into this report because it's not there just now. Um, again, as we start to look into the current report quarter that we're in, that has reduced down to 43 days. Um, so we are making kind of significant advances, albeit we're not quite where we want to be. We're obviously aiming for 20 days with those responses. Um, there's a lot of work going in from my team. They are relatively short staffed you could argue for the volume that they've got albeit they don't have any vacancies they just we are realizing that the demand for the service um has continued to go up and it's gone up across the organization quite significantly 30 percent realistically um is the overall uplift that we're looking at at an organizational level which has obviously got a huge ramifications for the workforce capacity that we've got um You'll see from the report that there were 10 complaints made about the NHS health services within the, the reporting quarter. Um, themes are similar to what we're seeing everywhere else across the organisation. We've got staff attitudes, we've got waiting times with communications, um, all of which we're starting to come up with some more in-depth action plans to see how we can try and resolve those issues before they ever come to a complaint. Um, in respect to staff attitude, we have first impressions training that runs as an optional part of our, our staff induction and overall staff development just now. We're looking to see how we build that in as a mand mandatory part of induction and then offer refresher courses. So we'll see how we can support that within the localities as well. Um, <clears throat> with regards to waiting times, we're looking to change how we provide information across our public facing um, internet services, etc and actually have the equivalent of a sort of FAQ that comes before the complaints form so that we can send people off in the directions to hopefully find the information that they might be looking for. Um, that Hopefully we would capture quite a lot of waiting times complaints again at an organisational level by doing that. Um, there's other bits that are going on in the background that will be there's some longevity in them and it will take us a long time to kind of get to any final outputs but we are looking to see how we can integrate um with digital health solutions to try and automate our processes a little bit more try and reduce the length of time that it's taken to get back to people try and speed up the investigation and make things a little bit more thorough so all of that is going on in the background and there's probably some national work that we're going to do um with the center of excellence for artificial intelligence and intelligence sorry in that regard um, again, it's a very, very long, long aim, but the, 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 the investment, I suppose, is there to try and just do things a little bit differently and make sure that we have everything that we need in place to, to properly respond to people and families um, and learn as a result as well. There is one SPSO investigation ongoing at the minute. I don't have a huge amount of uh, context as to whether we think they will uphold that or not but it's going through the sort of early stages just now so we'll keep an eye on that um some of the other things that are going on at an organizational level just now is the implementation of a child friendly complaints procedure uh, so that will have implications for the localities as well so the first part of that will be about consent um, and just making sure that we are looking for consent for anybody that's under the age of 18 directly We'll have to figure our way around the sort of age thresholds for that, how that would all work, how we make sure that children actually feel safe and supported to do that in a child friendly way. Um, so that but there will be an expectation that we move towards consent at a bare minimum by the end of July this year. 
Um, so we will be back in touch. There's a short life working group that is triggering today for the first formal meeting. Um, and the plan will be that we then take that group out to community sectors, schools, child nursing um, type forums to try and capture the voice of children and families in amongst that to see how we can do it um, with a little bit of collaboration in the design process. So that is all coming. Um, the learning side of complaints that we'd spoken about for feedback in this report, there was only one complaint upheld within the last quarter um, and there actually wasn't a learning point allocated to it. So it's quite difficult for us to put any context around that. It's something again that as an organisation we are looking at. We've got quite a low level of upheld complaints in comparison to the wider Scottish board at an organisational level. And we're looking to see if we need to do anything differently in that space, Gordon. It sounds like your teams have already been doing that over recent years. So that's very much where we're trying to get to as well. Um, and as a result, we we expect that we will build criteria around that to see if we're upholding. We expect a learning point um, and dependent upon the criticality of the complaint, just some criteria around that about what we would expect um, just to make sure that we are listening, learning and changing um, on the back of feedback. I think that's about me. If anybody's got any questions, I'm happy to answer. Thanks for that, Ailey. Any questions, comments for Ailey? Hi, Paul. Um, just Sorry. to ask for an advice. Sorry, Sorry. So it was just to ask, there's a question about care opinion and the value it, it, you feel it has in the improvements taking place? So care opinion from our perspective is quite often positive. So it's more about learning what goes well and sharing that throughout the other parts of the organisation for care opinion, <clears throat> as opposed to responding to what's not gone so well, which is obviously more the complaint side. I think it's really useful, Margot. I think it's useful even just for boosting staff morale as well. Um, we all know that the teams have been through a really, really difficult few years and those little care opinion stories do a whole lot of good for, for staff wellbeing locally. So there's a big piece of care opinion of where that sits as well of just boosting those spirits. So it's it, it's a massively useful forum um, and we need to capitalise on it. Absolutely. Thank you, Sarah. No mute, Sarah. Sorry. Sarah, you're muted. So I am. So I am. Apologies. Um, thanks, Chair. Ailey, I was wanting to pick up on the comments you were making about a working group starting today, um, around child friendly complaints handling. It was just to let you know which something that might be useful and certainly may reduce any duplication of effort. Um, that there is a working group. Um, that sits within Falkirk's Children's Partnership that is already undertaking quite a lot of work in this particular area. Um, and obviously this particular uh, complaints handling procedure is of significant importance to children's services and across all of our schools. So you talked about, you know, kind of making contact directly with children and schools. So um, I could share a contact name with you um, if you wanted to just take that contact into your working group, because um, it just means that we might not be needing to ask people the same questions in lots of different ways. And so I'll absolutely. pass that one to you if that would be helpful. Be wonderful. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Okay. That's good. Thank you for that. Any other questions, comments on that part of the report? OK. So we'll move on to section 10, which is our usual whistle stop tour through all things infection related in Fourth Valley with our regular infection related control correspondent, Jonathan. Jonathan, over to you. OK, thank you, Chair. And morning, everyone. Um, so this is the quarterly report for October to December of last year. So um, where, where I think it's re relevant, I'll give you an update of where we are now as well, because we're quite well into the the, the next quarter. So so during this uh, um, October to December, COVID numbers were quite appeared quite consistent in numbers. We had um, approximately about 15 inpatients per day. Numbers have fallen since then now, and, and even today now we're reaching a level where we, we've only got four inpatients in, in the across the hospital site. So we are seeing a bit of a shift in, in where we are with, with COVID, which is good. Um, I didn't mention anything about influenza at the um, in the quarterly report, because really influenza wasn't a 
um, a, a, a thing at that, in that quarter. We did see um, an increase this this quarter, this current quarter that we're in. Um, we had upwards of about 35 to 40 patients in at one um, point. We've had a couple of um, outbreaks associated that within the acute sector um, um, over the January and the end of February as well. Um, but numbers have again, and now have fallen again. So we're sitting at um, seven inpatients. So we think we're over the hump when it comes to influenza and COVID. However, we've got the Easter break coming up and when we gen generally see a little blip when people see relatives and, more, and what have you. So we're just anticipating a bit of a, an increase, a slight increase um, after the, the Easter period. Um, moving on to care homes, um, visits, um, infection prevention control visits um, are still ongoing. We have a regular schedule. So over a quarterly basis, we visit all care homes across Forth Valley um, and non-compliances remain very low. Um, we're very pleased with with the, the standards that we're seeing from an infection control point of view um, across the um, across the care homes. We are now progressing with um, proactive training. We've we've established quite I'd say robust relationships with with the care homes, and now they're they're reaching out to us and saying, can we have some training? We have some new staff on, please. Can we have some training, and so on. So we're we're um, embarking on some um, proactive training at the moment, which which is well received and also going well. Moving on to our AOP targets. Um, now, at the end of this month, that's the, the end of the, the current targets um, set for E. colobacteremia, Staphylococcus bacteremias, and C. difficile infections. Um, as you're aware, and I've talked about this on, for, um, for quite a while now, our E. coli bacteremias were unlikely to meet that target. Um, our Staphylococcus bacteremias and our C. difficile infections, we, we're anticipating that we should get it, providing our case numbers um, and infections uh, remain low for this this last month. Um, just to highlight as well from a national point of view, and I've put a graph into this report today from a from a national perspective, that um, nationally um, all three targets are unlikely to be met from a national perspective. So um, they are under review at the moment and we are anticipating notification from Scottish Government shortly, I imagine, before the end of this month, maybe the start of next month, about um, the revised um, um, targets going forward. Um, moving on to our surveillance for our Staphylococcus bacteremias, our device associated bacteremias, E. coli bacteremias, and Clostridium difficile infections. Nothing, no, no issues or concerns to raise to the committee. Um, numbers remained um, quite um, relatively consistent and and relatively low, um, and similar to previous quarters as well. So nothing really of concern to raise. Um, raise for you um, good news that there's no reported cases for any of these infections from Falker Community Hospitals or Bowness Community Hospital, which is good. And finally, on to outbreaks. Um, we did, we have seen a couple of um, number of um, outbreaks um, across our hospital sites over the last, of uh, certainly this quarter and and the, in October, between October and December. However, there were no reported outbreaks for Falkirk or Bowness Community Hospitals. Happy to take any questions. Thanks, Jonathan. Any questions for Jonathan? Do you see the, the see the the, the flu figures? For yes, sure, seem, seem to be quite low. Mm -hmm. uh, although we're mm -hmm. starting to go over Easter, which is quite early this year. Um, yeah. Uh, are we any? You know, what what we putting that down to? Uh, is it just we've had a low instance? It's a light flu season. Vaccination I helping? Do we know? I think the the vaccination has helped. Um, the, one of the the strains that are that is circulating is the H1N1. So those people remember way back in 1997, it was swine flu. If you remember, mm -hmm. uh, you know those are um, you can remember that. Um, so. It seems, you know, I think there's a lot of um, natural immunity, but also the the immunisation for the last couple of years have been covering the the current strains that are circulating at the moment. I think the numbers, um, the flu season, it has been a lot later. We usually see it around yeah. the Christmas period, you know, so it has been 
um, bumped by maybe three to four weeks. Um, why that is, who knows? It could be the influence of COVID. You know, we just don't know the epidemiological reasons for for the the delay in the season. But it, we we are quite lucky. I mean, the, the year before last, I think we had over sixty patients at one point in in hospital with with um, influenza. So our numbers seem to be low. And when we did have higher numbers, they were associated with a couple of outbreaks that we had across the acute site. So numbers, largely speaking, in terms of new admissions have, have remained, you know, relatively low, you know, like in the low twenties at, at worst, you know, so, so yeah. Um, so we're just hoping that, you know, it will just, I don't think we'll, we'll, we're anticipating any surge of infections over the next coming months, hopefully. Well, that's good to know. Maybe, maybe flu is just catching up with climate change and it's just, uh, the seasons <laughs> adapting. That's great. Listen, thanks for that, John. Any other okay. comments, questions for Jonathan? Okay, so we're back to Suzanne now. Uh, giving you a rest for a while, Suzanne. We're back to you for for uh, the publications. Thank you again, Chair. The report provides an overview of six national reports relevant to the Health and Social Care Partnership that have been published since the last committee meeting. The table in the report provides publication dates and full link and links, sorry, to the full reports. Um, in terms of just highlighting those, um, the National Mission on Drugs Annual Report sets out progress be made between the 1st of April uh, 2022 to 31st of March 2023 by national government, local government and third sector partners working together to reduce drug deaths. Um, this work has been progressed by the national mission um, and it's been developed uh, by Falkirk EDP in partnership with local services. And as we've noted um, earlier in the agenda, an update on the work of the ADP will be presented to DIGED me next week. Adults with incapacity delayed discharge good practice guidelines have been published and it compiles examples of adults with, in, adults with incapacity um, good practice. The report also provides 10 recommended, recommended actions sorry, for health and social care partnerships to consider implementing where EWI is an issue. Scotland's first dedicated self-harm and action plan um, for anyone affected by self-harm has been published and progress towards the actions within the strategy will be reviewed uh, after 18 months. It provides uh, an important connection uh, to the joint work on suicide prevention and mental health through the suicide prevention strategy and mental health wellbeing strategies. In March 2023, the Coalition of Carers in Scotland carried out a survey with carers to find out if they were aware of the rights that they had under the, Scot the Carer Scotland Act and whether the legislation had made a difference to the support and services they received. And the report uh, shows that despite the introduction of that, many of the rights and legislation are still not uh, truly fulfilled, and it makes a number of recommendations specifically how local authorities and health, board health boards can implement a human rights-based approach to supporting carers. And board members will also be aware that we've got a, an update on the carers' um, work at the next board meeting. Yeah, we've included a couple of publications um, around the renewed focus on sustainability of social care in terms of the Outcomes Commission and Audit Scotland's IGIB finance and performance reports uh, scope for further work that they plan to, also, uh, plan to complete over the 2024. So in conclusion, the report lists national reports that have been issued since the last few time. The committee is asked to consider and comment on the contents at set out in 2.1 to the report. Happy to take any questions. Thanks, Suzanne. Any questions for Suzanne? No. Uh, I suppose that the, the, the carers' rights was a, is a bit disappointing that the survey indicates that they, they don't think that led piece of legislation is working. So I suppose we'll look forward to hearing next week maybe what, what we can do in relation to that as well. So. But uh, yeah, lot, lot, lots of good information there that helps, keeps us well informed. OK. Well, folks, that's been a very quick drive through clinical care governance. I'll get a right row off our councillor Hannah for that. I don't tell her. Um, any, any other uh, AOCB that we've not, I've not been intimated by anything. Anyone want to bring anything up before we conclude the meeting? No? Okay, so uh, good to see you all. Uh, 
enjoy the rest of your day, enjoy the weekend, and we'll see most of you next week.